here in Acts chapter 18, and it gets us into Paul's, uh, the beginnings of Paul's ministry in Corinth. And you'll recall from the Bible, the New Testament, there's two epistles or letters of Paul called 1st and 2nd Corinthians, and uh, he was dealing there with a predominantly Gentile church. Uh, and uh, the issues that he raises in those letters, it makes it obvious that it was more Gentile than it was Jewish. And it tells us here that one of the reasons why is because the Jews, basically, as he went into the synagogue there in Corinth, they uh, were obstinate and refused to believe his message. So he said, therefore, I will go to the Gentiles, at least there in Corinth at that time. He continued to try to reach out to Jews everywhere he went. He would begin his ministry and his preaching and teaching most of the time in the synagogues. But in this case, the predominant uh, body of the Jewish people there rejected the message of Jesus. So he took it to the Gentiles and uh, Gentile church began to flourish. Uh, but he uh, was also, because of this ministry, they're threatened. Uh, and he uh, had to really seek the Lord and the Lord's guidance. And uh, you have verse 9 here where he says, And the Lord said to Paul, and during this difficult time, says, The Lord said to Paul in a night vision, this is Jesus talking to him, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking. And do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. Jesus already knew that there would be people in this city who would believe, who would come to believe in Jesus Christ. So he's encouraging Paul to continue in his ministry. So uh, in Corinth here, he comes into contact with this Jewish couple named Aquila and Priscilla. And they have basically the same kind of business that Paul has. Paul is not only ministering and preaching and teaching, he is working with his hands, and it calls him a tent maker, but it also could mean he, he made more than just tents. Uh, he made all kinds of leather works, if you will, for that day and that time. And this couple all ha also had a similar business, but they were also Christians. Uh, so he gets to know them, Aquila and Priscilla, and he mentions this married couple uh, often in his letters, and they became uh, very vital partners in his ministry with him, both of them. And what's interesting about this couple is that sometimes in the Bible, Aquila is mentioned first as the man, and sometimes his wife Pr Priscilla, or also Prisca, is another way to say her name, Sometimes, and all more often, she is mentioned first, which is really astounding, especially in the context of the ancient world, that a woman would be a lot of times even mentioned at all, much less mentioned first ahead of her husband in any ancient text. But anyway, that's a little extra side point today, no extra charge for that. But anyway, uh, he meets this couple that became vital partners in ministry, but then Paul begins to move back to some of these other areas as we see that his pattern was. He went back to some of the other areas where he had preached and taught and established churches. And it says he went back to strengthen them. And uh, while he was gone, there was a man named Apollos uh, who was coming through the area that Paul had never met up to this point and that uh, Aquila and Priscilla had never met. But he came from Alexandria, Egypt, into Ephesus. Now you also remember there's a letter to the Ephesians. So we're seeing the founding of these churches. So this man named Apollos who's coming from Alexandria, Egypt, which was one of the uh, most educated uh, areas of the world. And it tells us here in this passage as he comes into Ephesus, he's coming from Alexandria, it tells us that he was well versed in the scriptures and that he taught, I'm going to read it here in a second, but that he taught the things of Jesus. But there was something deficient in his knowledge and his understanding. He was a great speaker. He was a great orator. He, he was very eloquent and educated. Uh, yet there's something missing in his faith. Something that's lacking in his faith and in his understanding. And that's where I want to pick up here as he encounters this married couple 
named Aquila and Priscilla. It says now, verse 24, uh, now a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And he wished to cross to Achaia. The brothers encouraged and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who through grace had believed. For he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that Christ, the Christ, was Jesus. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Now there's a lot of mystery here as to what is really going on, but we've got to remember we're in this period where uh, we're just a few years out, maybe a decade or so out from, or a little more, from the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And there would still be people in different areas that had witnessed and heard the, the preaching of John the Baptist and the declaration of John the Baptist that this Jesus of Nazareth truly was the Messiah and the Son of God and the Lamb of God and would take away the sins of the world. And they would have been baptized uh, under John's ministry and would have began to follow Jesus and uh, listen to Jesus or hear about Jesus as word would have spread to wherever they were. And Apollos was familiar with Jesus and he knew from the scriptures that Jesus really was the Messiah, but there was something lacking in his faith and his knowledge and understanding of who Jesus was in his fullness. Apparently, he had not learned uh, about maybe the resurrection and the implications of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, and he had not uh, maybe heard about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost and all of the things that have begun to, begun to transpire uh, thereafter with Jesus' closest circle, his inner circle disciples. And we see that there's also another group right on the heels of this in Acts 19 at the first section here. There's this other group also in Ephesus and they too are, they understand the baptism of John and they understand some things about Jesus, but there's something lacking. And Paul encounters them as he's making his way back to Ephesus. And he asks them, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? And they said, we don't even know, we don't even think we've heard of the Holy Spirit. Well, they're not saying they don't know anything about the Holy Spirit as the Holy Spirit's mentioned in the Old Testament. And they're not saying they never heard uh, anything uh, coming from John or John's closest disciples that there would be an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. They just hadn't heard about the fulfillment of it yet. So Paul lays hands on them and he prays for them to receive the Holy Spirit and they begin to speak in tongues as an evidence and sign that they have been filled with the Holy Spirit. So you go back to this guy, Apollos, and it doesn't tell us exactly what's going on, but we can fill in some of the gaps, is that he was doing pretty well. He was doing okay, but there was something else that he needed. And this married couple who were tent makers, think maybe uh, construction workers, uh, uh, leather makers, okay, leather workers, uh, they worked with their hands, but they were preaching and teaching as a married couple together. And they pulled this guy from Alexandria, Egypt, who was very, very educated and quite eloquent. They pull him aside to have a little conversation to fill in the gaps. Now, I don't think it takes much imagination to think about how Apollos could have responded to that. <laughs> he could have thought, who do you think you are? Who are you 
to try to teach me anything. Don't you know who I am and where I come from? Haven't you heard what I've already been saying? I don't need you. Who do you think you are? I don't need you to teach me anything. Can't you imagine Apollos responding that way? Possibly. Yet, he doesn't. He obviously listens to them so he can grow in his knowledge and his understanding because Apollos, Apollos knows there's always room to grow. And that's something that sometimes we forget ourselves. We can forget ourselves that we all always have room to grow, that we always have a need to learn, to learn. If you will recall many, many weeks ago, we talked about how the church in the book of Acts, as it started out, some of the summary verses in the first uh, or the second chapter tell us that basically the church uh, continued in fellowship with one another and they continued in worship with one another and they met the needs of one another, but they also continued to grow and learn together. They continued in the apostles' doctrine and their teaching and that would have meant that they would apply, have applied their minds to grow in their understanding of what it all meant and all the implications of it. And we see that too where Paul is preaching in Berea in Acts chapter 17. And the Bereans, after they hear the preaching of Paul, it says they go and they search the Scriptures to see whether these things are so. And they're having these aha moments. They're, they're beginning to see, oh my goodness, look at this. This is how this fits. This is how Jesus fulfills that. Can you imagine how excited that they were? Kind of like those two on the road to Emmaus as they're taken aside by Jesus Himself and He goes through that big Bible study all the way through the Scriptures and it says they say their hearts burned within them as He opened unto them the Scriptures. So the church is a, wor a worshiping community. The church is a fellowshipping community, a loving community where we help each other and take care of each other's needs. But the church is also always a learning community. We always have room to grow. All of us, no matter how sophisticated or educated or not, we always have room to go and we can always learn. And we can learn from anybody. We can learn from each other. I can learn from you. And I do. I try to. But learning requires this thing called humility. Humility. Sometimes we don't want to hear anything new that we can that's true, even if it's true, because we're prideful. We think, I don't need to know that. I already understand that. I don't need to pay attention to that. I've heard that already before. And we miss out on an opportunity to gain insight because of pride. There's other times where we can miss out on a learning opportunity, not because of pride, but because of fear. Sometimes, have you ever been just afraid to admit you didn't know something? Have you ever been made fun of because you didn't know something? Or know how to do something? And, you know, as a kid growing up, I mean, that happened all the time, right? I mean, you're growing up and, and you don't know how to do something. Sometimes even adults can be quite cruel because you don't know anything. Then you become afraid to, that's why people want, the teachers always tell us there's no stupid questions, right? But people are afraid of embarrassment so they don't raise their hands. Or we don't want to admit we need some help. We need some help to gain some insight, to gain some self-control or some mastery over some area of life. And we just don't want to admit it that we need some help because it requires humility to lay our pride down. You can learn from anybody. Sometimes we may look at somebody and think, oh my goodness, they couldn't possibly have anything to contribute to my life at all. I remember a man growing up in my community, he just lived uh, up in Pilot Mountain, right on the edge of town there, and he was a grown adult. He's probably in his 30s at the time, and uh, he was a special needs kind of fellow, still living at home with his mom and dad, and his name was Gary Marshall. Now, Gary could not tell you one whit about Shakespeare, and he couldn't tell you anything about how to parse Hebrew or Greek verbs, but he could tell you everything you ever wanted to know about groundhogs and how to kill them. 
And as a matter of fact, he carried around a little notebook with him. Everywhere he went, and his rifle was always with him in his truck with his dad. And he could show you that notebook and tell you the, the last two weeks or the last month how many groundhogs he had killed and where he had killed them and how he had killed them. And my dad, I loved listening to Gary when I was a little boy, but my dad was always fascinated to learn more about what Gary could teach him about how to kill groundhogs. Because we grew watermelons and we grew pumpkins and we grew cantaloupes and tomatoes and, and all kinds of stuff that we needed to keep the groundhogs out of if we were going to sell the produce in our store and sell it off the back of the truck as we used to. So we learned a lot about groundhogs and how to kill groundhogs from Gary Marshall. You can learn something from anybody if we'll humble ourselves enough to just listen. But humility is not always the prized virtue. There are even some cases where it... Hitler, for example, and the Nazis in Nazi Germany, they despised the Christian virtue of humility. They were all about pride. They were all about strength. They saw humility being uh, willing to admit weaknesses as a weakness, okay, and something to be avoided. They despised that virtue of humility, but that is one of the most important virtues of the Christian faith is Humility. Humility, if you go look at the ancient pagan philosophers, some like we, what we talked about last week, you would see all kinds of virtues. Courage would be there, and there would be many other things, but you would not find humility. It wasn't seen as a virtue. A typical pagan way of looking at the world was about power and domination, not weakness, and humility was seen as a weakness, and the cross of Jesus Christ proved that it's not a weakness, it's one of the greatest of strengths. Even somebody like Coach K can be a little turned off by humility. I was sitting at Cameron Indoor Stadium after one of their practice uh, games, I think it was, I can't remember, but I think they had the blue-white game, and Coach K and some of the players were out there sitting at center court answering questions and talking a little bit about their hopes and aspirations for the season. And there was a guy in the audience who had a sign up that said, stay humble. And Coach K took a little bit of an exception to that. He said, stay humble. I don't know. I think we need a little bit of arrogance more than we need humility. These guys need to be a little arrogant. And he kind of went on and on about that. But I thought to myself, I guarantee you, I guarantee you in practice that one of his play players, if he was trying to show them something, and I've seen some of his practice sessions. <laughs> if they, he was trying to show them how to do something or run one of his plays, and they said, I don't need you to teach me anything, I guarantee you he would take exception to that, wouldn't he? Now, he he'd take exception and would have a few exceptional words, those really kind of short words, the four-letter type, right? I know for a fact. So he too valued humility when he was trying to coach his players they had to be humble enough even though he would bring in maybe the greatest of talents from all over the country they would have to be willing to humble themselves enough to listen to him and not all of them would to the same degree but to listen to him and learn from him how to do things to be the most successful humility is an important virtue and it's required for learning, especially learning and growing in the scriptures, knowing that we always have room to grow. I remember talking to a fellow uh, of a church member a few few years ago, and he was in his 70s, and and uh, he was very knowledgeable of scripture and different verses and different things here and there. But honestly, he was just mixed up and confused on so many things. I mean, just so many things. But he had this idea that he had it all figured out. And he just flat out told me, you know, I mean, we weren't having any kind of debate or anything. It was just, we were just having a good time talking. And he was just talking about his knowledge of the scriptures. And he said, you know, about this point in my life, I don't really think I can learn much more about the Bible. I'm like, oh my goodness, my jaw hit the floor. I said, I read the scriptures every single day. I've studied them in Greek. I've studied them in Hebrew. I've studied the ancient cultures and the background all of it, and I study it every single day, 
and I still get confused on things. I still get things mixed up. I still need to be reminded of things. I was even in the middle of a vacation Bible school talking about the story of the Israelites being delivered from Egypt and how Moses went before Pharaoh. And the way I told the story, I can't remember, I was talking about uh, some of the, the figures in the story and I just got a couple of the names mixed up and this little kid, 10 years old, raises his hand and says, Pastor Cliff, that's not right. So-and-so didn't do such-and-such, -such, it was so-and-so. And I was like, you know, you're right. I make mistakes. I don't know everything. I don't remember everything. Do you? Do you know anybody who does? So it requires humility. I don't care how old we are. If he was 170, uh, he still wouldn't even begin to fathom the depths of the knowledge and the wisdom of Jesus Christ. Paul said, how unsearchable is God's ways? How deep is the knowledge of God? Far, far greater than anything we could ever imagine. We always have room to go, no matter who we are, no matter where we come from. And Apollos did. As great as he was, as great of a speaker as he was, he always has room to grow. And he was willing to listen to Aquila and Priscilla. Priscilla and Aquila. One of the most astounding things about that is he was willing to listen to the woman too. And in the ancient world, that's radical. We kind of take for granted how radical that was, but in the ancient world, in the pagan world especially, that was radical. Who are you, woman, to try to think that you could possibly teach me anything. There's still a lot of folks that think that way today, even in America, I'm sad to say. And even in the churches, sometimes, I'm sad to say. Who do you think you are? Instead of humbling ourselves and really listening and really growing in the grace and knowledge of Christ, running around acting like we've already got it all figured out, we know everything. You know, Aquila and Priscilla were also basically lay preachers. They weren't educated. They hadn't been, certainly the woman hadn't been ordained in any official setting in the Jewish community or anything like that. Uh, they maybe had been uh, prayed over and laid hands on and set apart for ministry, but they were basically lay preachers. They didn't come out of any kind of seminary, so to speak, or any kind of uh, special program or anything like that. They knew what they knew, though. And they could teach and share with Apollos. And Apollos was willing to listen. You know, in the Methodist church, the original Methodist movement was a movement within the Church of England. And it was led by John and Charles Wesley who were ordained Anglican priests and very, very educated men. But the majority of the preachers and the leaders of the movement were not clergy. The vast majority of them were lay people who had not had the education officially, but they were able to learn and to grow and to share and to preach and to teach. And if it wasn't for lay people, there would not be any Methodism in America. Even the first bishop who was ordained elder and bishop basically on the same day, Christmas of 1784, for much of most of his ministry, I think, uh, leading up to that time, he was just a lay preacher and an organizer of the Methodist movement here in America. Yet it was these lay preachers, often circuit riders, getting on horses before there was an official denomination and going all over this country in the highways and the byways, everywhere they could go, preaching and teaching the gospel and founding churches. And they would have to oftentimes sleep out in the elements. They would oftentimes... They didn't have the Toyota Sienna that I got. They didn't have the Toyota Corolla. And I don't think they had any air conditioning on the horse or any heat in the winter on the horse. And they were living in rough, rough conditions. And if somebody would take them in, a lot of times they end up having to sleep out in the barn. And if they got any kind of home-cooked meal, most of the time it was something like pumpkin stew. Ew. That don't sound too appetizing, does it? And their average lifespan was only about 30 years because of the roughness of the conditions they lived and worked and ministered under. It was rough. John Wesley lived to be almost 90 years old. That was a miracle in and of itself. 
Francis Asbury, who became the first bishop, lived to be about 70-some years old. But you should see all, read about all the battles of illnesses that he had to go through. Just the strep throat alone just almost emaciated his heart. And then you know the treatments that they used back in the day, putting leeches and stuff on you. I mean, just surviving the treatments would have been a, a miracle in many cases. Yet, Francis Asbury, who spent most of his life as a lay preacher, he could go into any community in the United States during the presidency of George Washington, and he would be more likely to be recognized by face than the president himself. He traveled hundreds of thousands of miles to do what he did. And people were willing to listen and to learn and to grow. Learning requires humility. John Wesley said this. He said, Give me 100 preachers who fear nothing but sin and desire nothing but God, and I care not whether they be clergymen or laymen. They alone will shape the gates of hell and set up the kingdom of heaven upon earth. Richard Hayes was at one time the dean of Duke Divinity School. He's a world-renowned New Testament scholar. And one of his books, and a lecture I've heard, he says this. He says, among New Testament scholars today and a lot of pastors that have been trained in seminary, he said, I have to explain to them what is obvious to the people in the pews. A lot of times our pastors and our theologians coming out of our seminaries they have been so indoctrinated into so much mess that they don't even understand the very basics, a lot of times, of the Christian faith. And this world-renowned scholar says he spends a lot of his time explaining to other scholars and pastors what is obvious to the people in the pews. We can all learn from anybody, and we all need to learn from each other. And that's going to require humility. That's going to require the spirit that a man like Apollos had, even though he was so educated and sophisticated. He had the spirit that I'm sure he learned from the scriptures itself, where he read, I'm sure many, many times, Psalm 86, 11, for example, teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. That's a humble heart, and that's a humble spirit. Let us pray. Father, we thank you today that we can learn and grow. Give us the humility that we need, all of us, Lord, and help us to learn from each other and wherever and from whoever you'll use to teach us. To the glory of your name, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our Lord and Father.